Welcome to Adapter's Advantage, breakthrough moments that lead to success. Our podcast brings you insider stories of the moments that matter, turning points on the sometimes rocky road to success. Here's your host, Mark Magnaca, president and co-founder of Alego, the workforce training and readiness platform built for distributed teams. Hi, I'm Mark Magnaca, and I wanna welcome you to the next episode of the Adapter's Advantage podcast. My guest today is Jay Webb, who's the founder and president of the J. David Group. And he's been helping world-class companies like Allego hire world-class talent for over 14 years. He's also the host of Over Quota, which is a podcast that features his exclusive interviews with CEOs, sales leaders, and top enterprise software salespeople about the keys to their success and what, in their opinions, separates the best salespeople from everybody else. And I'm going to be building on asking him several questions related to that topic, because I know he's learned a lot about it. So Jay, as we jump right in, given all that I just covered about your background, your business, the podcast, how do you answer the question? So what do you do? (laughs) Great question. Thanks for having me, Mark. I'm really excited to be here and obviously a a fan of of a Lego. I love what you guys are doing over there um, for sure. And frankly, it's funny, every time I ask one of my guests um, what kind of technology they're using um, to enable virtual training these days. They don't really have the best answer. So I think there's something we can talk about <laughs> later on about that. Right. Um, but so what do I do? Um, essentially, uh, you know, the, the core of my business is helping enterprise technology and software companies find uh, sales leaders and salespeople. I think more specifically, the pain that I solve is, is that they are, you know, anybody can search for salespeople to hire. The challenge though, is if let's say for instance, you go on LinkedIn or you go on Google and you start searching, it's just a maze and you don't know where to begin. You don't know how to actually begin your reach out. And what I do is just essentially uh, narrow that field, if you will, so that by the time you see candidates from me as a, as a company, um, they're, the, they're the right ones, right? They've, they've been vetted. Um, they're targeted specifically for your organization. And what happens is it saves you a whole bunch of time, whether it's your hiring manager or an internal recruiter, it saves you a bunch of time from doing all the sourcing and hours and hours that it takes to actually find the right people. But then it also helps you go to market quicker in a particular territory. So you have something sitting there for, you know, a month or two months and, and it's un, you know, attended to, if you will. Um, what I'm going to do is bring that person to the table in a lot faster um, fashion so you can get that person in that territory up and running. So that's what I do on the, on the recruiting end. And the podcast, of course, is just a way to um, bring it all together, essentially, right? So I, ha- I, love, I love having these conversations, Mark, with decision makers about what makes them tick. I love talking to salespeople about what motivates them and, and, and what makes, you know, how, they, how they've been performing with their value propositions and all that. But, you know, they've been private conversations. I decided to uh, illuminate those conversations and create the podcast as a way to do a number of different things. First of all, just share all that information. So if people are growth minded and are really looking for information um, to simply get better in many, many different areas, they can come and listen to over quota. If you're looking for a job, the people that I'm that I have on are often directors of talent or chief revenue officers, VPs of sales, who uh, not only talk about the differences between the best salespeople that they've led and managed than everybody else, but they also talk a little bit about how they evaluate talent during the interview process so you can become a stronger candidate that way as well. Um, and so I don't necessarily like transactional business, right? Where it's just sort of, I have something, let me know, let you know about it. It's, I like to have relationship building and the Overquota podcast is a great way for me to bring a community together and continue to build relationships on both sides. You know, Jay, what's really interesting listening to you about that is the fact that uh, the same notion that we talk a lot about in our business, about this idea of content cur- curation, right? In, in the same way, there's like over 6,000 shows on Netflix right now. You can't watch them all. You can't know everything. And so to the extent there's some curation, either by Netflix or by a friend who says, you know, these are a couple of shows that, you know, you probably would really enjoy based on who you are and what's important to you. As you were just describing that, I thought about how valuable it is to have someone who understands the culture, who can begin that vetting process versus as a busy sales leader trying to do everything and then ending up interviewing perhaps qualified candidates who are just totally wrong fit for an organization. And then you've wasted that most precious of resources, your time. Yeah, I mean, that's just a non-renewable resource, right? Time, you you can't get it back. 
And I like that word that you use, curate, because that's essentially what it is. And yeah, that's 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 what I do. I, I help hiring managers um, and internal recruiters, frankly, get their get their time back because internal recruiters also have a lot on their plate coming from the hiring managers and simply can't do it all. So I augment um, their pipeline and de-stress um, <laughs> their plate, if you will. That's a good message. That's a good message right there. So I'm going to pivot, Jay. One of the things that I found so interesting in getting a chance a chance to talk with so many people across a range of different industries is a question about mistakes. Uh, a big part of the operating principles at Allego is this notion of loving your mistakes, like being willing to accept that when you've made a mistake and you recognize it, that means you learn something, right? And it's how we all learn. But in so many places, there's this aversion to either admit that you've made a mistake or to learn something from it. So the question I have is, uh, given that fact that most of us learn best from our mistakes, what's one big mistake that's taught you a valuable lesson in your business? Oh man, I'm so good at making mistakes. <laughs> I don't think, I, don't think I, I, I honestly don't think I would ever learn a thing if I didn't make mistakes because I've made a lot of them. As my mother used to say, you're a glutton for punishment. <laughs> you know, so let me just add some context to what I just said. So I'm a big believer in learning an acronym that I came up with. It's a little crass, but it's L-A-I-D, LAID. Learn, act, iterate, duplicate. <clears throat> so I'm a big believer in learning and I learn quickly, but I also am impatient with what I learn. And as a result of being impatient with what I learn, I want to put it into action really quickly, either because sure. I get excited about it or I just don't want to forget what I, what, what I learned. And I also challenge myself constantly because I'm like, you're just going to sit here and take this information. You're actually going to use it in some way, right? So I have to get to that action part very fast. And as a result of getting to that action part, I end up making a lot of mistakes. Um, I think the overarching mistake that I've made um, time and time again throughout my career, <laughs> and I'm actually fighting the urge right now, just even as in my own little business, is um, to, take on, to, to, to take on too many uh, projects at once. And when I say projects, I don't even necessarily mean too many uh, companies that say, hey, we want you to recruit for us. But I mean, um, like, the, right. So the podcast is an example, right? Sure. <laughs> it's it's the people when they look at my LinkedIn profile, they go, so are you still like, are you a recruiter? Are you a podcast? Like, what's your day job? Right. I go both. <laughs> like, right. like I, I do both. I actually had a, a competitor reach out to me to advertise on the, the podcast and said, um, you know, I'm not sure. He's like, are you still recruiting or like, or you know, <laughs> I'd love for you to be, a, I'd love to, you know, advertise on your podcast. I think it's great. And like, ah, uh, actually, no, I'm, I'm doing that too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I could, but the price will be, it will yeah. be off the rate card. <laughs> That's right. If you can pay what my clients are paying all right, <laughs> then for, a, for a higher than perfect. That's actually quite a nice, that, that's quite a nice <laughs> acknowledgement really, you know? <laughs> it's, yeah, right. I'll take, absolutely. But the over quota and the J David group work seamlessly, right? They, they come together nicely. <clears throat> but I tried to, French, frankly, create a, an email marketing tool. Not tried, I actually literally did. I invested a lot of money into it, like thousands of dollars um, over, th over a three-year period of time. I spent hours and hours and hours working on that while I was building the J David group and, and continue to, continuing to recruit. And at some point, what happens is, is that your eye gets taken off the ball. And before you know it, you're, you know, you're far further along, further away from the core of your business and and it it diminishes your ability to to drive the initial results that you intended to drive um, to begin with so you know i think time and time again because i'm just curious but i'm also ambitious when i say ambitious i don't mean ambitious in the sense of you know i want to conquer the world but meaning that we, we talked about time and how it's a non-renewable resource it's like i feel like i want to try to squeeze as much as i possibly can in to right. every moment of every day, right? And that goes to meetings as well, where it's like you're running right up against the next one just because you wanted to do something right before that one. And it's so it's that's the thing I think that uh, you know if, if you if I look at my career, what was what is the biggest mistake? That's the overarching one. There are a lot of specific ones, but that's the big mindset one that I have to shift. Let's talk about how have you grown your business? And, and as a reminder, how long have how long has the J David Group been in business? It started March fourteenth, two thousand and eleven. So it'll be ten Fantastic. years. Fantastic. Yeah. That's fantastic. So, I mean, I don't have to tell you, you've already made the five-year milestone, right? You're coming up to the 10-year milestone, which literally puts you in, in the top 10% of all businesses because 90% tragically don't survive for 10 years. Amazing. And the numbers, by the way, post-pandemic, 
will change because so many hardworking people in the restaurant business and in so many small businesses that they've just been unable to adapt to this massive change. Yeah, it's true. So how have you built your business pre pandemic and what, if anything has changed? It's interesting. When I started the J David group, the unemployment rate was actually higher than it is now. It was at 9.5% <clears throat> in March of 2011. And when I started it, it was almost like, like we just talked about, I knew that I was going to start my own business at one point in my life. And I knew after getting my 10,000 hours, which was around the fourth year of, or third or fourth year of what I was doing before, you know, working for a company, uh, it, it, it was time. Yeah, and, I gotta stop you there for one second. Sure. I want to hear the rest of this, but you just said something very important. I don't want to miss it. Sure. Um, you said, I knew I was going to start a business. Mm -hmm. now, I, that's a topic I'm fascinated in because I'm always curious how much of this is innate mm -hmm. and how much of it is support from your family, your environment, how much of the belief that I'm going to start a business sometime comes just sort of built in or some of it, or how much of it is in the environment? What was it for you? The environment really growing up, it was, you know, just looking frankly at the adults in my life and them not coming to work or coming, not coming home, I should say, uh, <laughs> you know, exuberant or a smile on, on their face or leaving the home, not necessarily feeling that way as well. And, you know, it was just one of those things First of all, I was a, an, I wanted to be an athlete my entire life. And so I played sports and, you know, if I didn't have to, I was trying to avoid working for anybody. And so once I realized that that wasn't going to happen, then I knew that I, I had to start a, a business and I wasn't sure what it was going to be, but I knew I was going to start a business because I, I needed to, to this, you know, what we talked about earlier, I have a, a mind that needs to be untethered and I need to explore those things. I always have. <clears throat> And so that's really what it was. And then when I Great. got into recruiting initially, it was, oh, okay, I get this. This is this this makes sense. And it's not there's no startup costs to this, right? right. <laughs> if I can pay my right. if I can figure out a way to do this and pay my bills, all I need is a laptop, me, and a phone, and I'm good. And that's that's what it was. I love it. I love it. Now what's interesting is you so that was your frame of reference, but there would be many people there this I I mean I've 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 worked and coached so yeah. many people who wanted it. And I couldn't quite figure out what was wrong, but the questions they would ask you things like not there's, they wouldn't say there's no startup costs. They would say, well, will I be getting a salary when I'm started? What will I do for health insurance? Right. And so their mind starts to build all the obstacles in instead of you saying, well, wait a minute, I already have a, I already have a laptop. I got a phone. Let's get started. Right. It's not what it's not. It's not to me. It's not, um, you know, I can't, it's how can right? It's not, I can't do this. I can't do this. It's how can I do that? How can I make this work? You know, you, you said something earlier about um, <clears throat> this learning process and it made me think, <clears throat> Jay, of one of my, uh, my favorite Tony Robbins quotes where he says, uh, uh, everyone thinks it's knowledge is power. And he says, no, knowledge is potential power, right? It's the ability to act on that knowledge. That's the power. There's right. a lot of very smart people who know lots of stuff. They have no capacity to mm -hmm. act but you had the capacity to act. So here we are coming up on 10 years. Hmm. How much of the business is now word of mouth referral versus the podcast sort of exposing you to new people? It's interesting. So there's the two sides of the business obviously are the client side who are hiring the candidates and then the candidate side. So on the candidate side, it's interesting because it's, <laughs> it's one of those things where uh, you, you, I cannot replenish the best candidate, right? So you guys, for instance, are making an offer to one of my candidates. Um, once that candidate is hired by a Lego, I can't right. go out and get the same candidate, right? Yeah, <laughs> I can't, exactly. I can't go it's a non-renewable resource. It's a, right, exactly, right. Yeah. Time's non-renewable. The candidates are non-renewable, right? They, yeah. You just can't, you can't get more of them. So it ha as a result, what happens is, is that yes, candidates will refer people to me, but I can't, that certainly can't be my lifeblood because most of the time referrals from candidates are often where they're helping a friend who needs a job right? rather than helping a recruiter who needs a placement, <laughs> if yeah, you will, right? Right. Totally right. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, the, so the motivations aren't necessarily aligned and you normally what I'll get on that side are just, you know, candidates that are nice and, you know, they're good people and I'm sure they've done well in their own right. But oftentimes I can't necessarily find a seat for them, which is another reason why I do the podcast, by the way, because 95% of the time I'm telling people no, but it's a good way to sort of move people over to the podcast and say, hey, you know, if you want to learn more about, you know, getting better at being a candidate or what else, what else is out there, you should listen to the podcast and listen to episode, you know, 35. They're not my client, but they are hiring, something like that, right? And Jay, you know what's so great about that? Yeah. 
tell me if this is your experience. Mm -hmm. Only a very small percentage will actually do that, follow up with you and say, I listened to it. Now that I've heard that, that's the kind of company I'd like to learn more about. A very that, small percentage. Great. Yes, there's no question. There's no question. It's probably less than 1%, yeah. um, to, to be frank, right? Uh, and by the way, it goes to the point that you were saying earlier about action, right? It's like you get the info, you get the, the, the knowledge, right? But it's really, and knowledge is powerful. But if you don't, and there it is, the knowledge. I'm curating it for you on the right. podcast. Go, and I'm telling you, there it is. Here's the link yeah. specifically to this episode, right? So it's, yeah, so people have to, so have to act on it. So to, to round out that answer, basically what happens is, is on the candidate side, I need to um, really do direct targeting. So I spend my life pretty much on LinkedIn uh, recruiter and constantly build out talent pools and searches and build pipeline constantly. And then I figured out just even through that whole email thing that I was telling you about, because that's part of a passion of mine. The template piece, yeah. Yeah, and figuring out what, what works, right? In other words, I test a lot of emails and try to optimize I'm a geek about this, but optimize subject lines, optimize um, um, the opener, optimize the body, the call to action, like optimize everything and get it to the point where, you know, I end up getting these high response rates. Um, and, and really that's, that's, that's what I, that's what I do. That's, that's how I, I do it. So referral side on the client side, and then obviously, um, you know, direct marketing, so to speak on the, on the candidate side. In your experience, how often is a candidate demonstrating emotional intelligence a differentiator between the very best people as sales talent and and let's call it the the average salesperson. Yeah, there's no question. It's um, always. <laughs> I, mean, <Okay>. if you, <laughs> I mean, frankly, if you have if you have candidates that are showing emotional intelligence, what I mean by that is is that they are um, curious. They're um, they're prepared. They're um, they're intellectually engaging. I'll say. Right? Yeah. By intellectually engaging, I mean when you when you when you sit there and you listen to them tell their story or their experience, um, you, you 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 come to the when you come to the meeting with a certain perception of the candidate, and you're only talking to the candidate hopefully because you really like their profile, and then it elevates from there. That usually means that there's uh, they're intellectually engaging, right? They're interesting. They're doing things slightly differently than 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 other folks. And, and so when it comes to that, why that relates to, you know, emotional intelligence is because <clears throat> they tend to have a level of self-awareness that shines through as a result of how they're telling the story and how, and, and how they've, um, you know, gone through their experience and the decisions that they've made. Um, so that's the other thing, too, is, is that really being self-aware, understanding when they shouldn't talk too much, when they should emote when they should do certain things, when they should ask qualifying questions, when they should, should when they should, um, you know, match and mirror, like those types of things, I think, um, when they have good follow up, right, I think that's good emotional intelligence as well, especially when they have when you give them bad news, right, like how, in, you know, what, what are they, what, how are they responding um, to, to, um, to, cr to criticism or critique? Um, you know, how, how coachable are they, right, all those things really fall into um, the emotional intelligence, because people who are, um, let's say overly emotional. They are, they are, they have no room for being self-aware. Um, right. And as a result of being not, of not being self-aware, um, they do certain things that aren't necessarily uh, in line with with helping themselves. Right. They they don't listen to advice. Um, you know, they over talk. Um, they get defensive. You know, those types of things that. Uh, so yeah, clearly the people that have good, strong emotional intelligence are the ones that went out. And the other thing too, by the way, is, is that it just goes back to, you know, you, you talk about preparedness, but it also goes back to intellectual curiosity, right? Like I'm, I, I, when I have a new client, when I know that I'm about to speak with a new company or new client, <clears throat> I'm looking at their company as if I'm going to interview, right? In other words, like, and, and, but I think more so, not even necessarily because I feel it's necessary, but I legitimately get really interested in what their value proposition is and try to figure out what their go to market is and then look at their salespeople and figure out, okay, who are these people and where do they come from? And just everything about it to me is interesting, which is why I think this is a great job to have. But, uh, and then people that don't do that, speaking of jobs, are they just kind of interviewing for a job or is it really something strategic that fits into their trajectory of their career, right? Like this right. really matters for a particular reason. And then why does it matter for that reason? Right. And I don't know, I think people just for the most part end up missing that. Well, my observation is that some of, not all, but some of, I'll call it just um, the bravado of being in a city like Boston, 
where there was so many things happening with so many companies and so much money flowing, like sort of this mindset of like, to your earlier point, hey, look, I'm busy, you, you know, this is the way it rolls. I think the pandemic has sort of shaken that thing up a little bit and said, actually, I think things are kind of coming a little bit more back in balance. Like you got to be willing to play ball if you want to be in this game. So that leads me to the question um, as it relates to sales managers. And the question is, what's the biggest frustration you've noticed for sales managers trying to hire salespeople remotely? Interesting. I actually don't think that the frustration necessarily is coming from the sales managers necessarily in the whole recruiting process. I think it's a lot about the, uh, it's the frustration and I'd say a little bit of trepidation comes from the candidate side. In other words, because I've, I've talked to several candidates during this whole pandemic where they're having Zoom meetings and it's, um, they don't have the soft sort of walk back to, to the door or back to the parking lot where it's a little bit more lighthearted, uh, right? In, in other yeah. words, it's just a button that they click at the end of the meeting. <laughs> you know, so, so, so in other words, it sort of ends and there's not that yeah. sense that sometimes when someone's walking you back out to the lobby, yep. it, there's just a little bit of a vibe, like, did I do all right? Did I not do all right? Yeah, you, yes. you, you think the screen goes black and you're like left hanging. That's it, you know, and I've heard that from from several candidates. So I think it hurts the candidate experience a little bit. I think from a um, from a, a hiring perspective, it's one of those things where, you know, if you look at it from just evaluating talent, there are certain other cues now that you're looking for, right? It's not necessarily about are their shoes shined, let's just say, or, you know, how neat do they look as, as they as they walk through the door, but it can also be about you know, their own preparedness and decision making when it comes to how do they show up for the Zoom meeting? Like, what, what's right. the background? What is their lighting? Right. Um, you know, do they, are, are there notifications that are going off during all this? Like, how much did they actually think about <clears throat> what it was that they were doing before they, before they showed up to this meeting, right? Did they close up, did they close other applications on their, on their device so that the bandwidth is strong, right? Like just <clears throat> those types of things, right? And then not, and let's just set aside the whole family thing because that that's in and of itself something that you necessarily can't always control depending on the dynamic of, sure. you know, whether you live in an apartment, a big house, how many kids you have, the whole nine yards, right? Age, all that stuff. Okay, forget about all that, but just in terms of the things that you literally can control, um, I think so that hiring managers can look at things through that paradigm and, and make certain determinations and evaluations that they may not, um, have made before. And I think the other thing too, I guess, with when it comes to hiring and maybe a little bit of a hurdle, you know, on conversely, when it comes to walking a candidate to the door is, is that, you know, when I used to go meet people in person, uh, specifically new companies, you know, and I'll use a Lego as an example too, as well, a few years ago, you know, met with George and Erica and, and several, several other folks and, you know, we walked around the office and I was able sure. to experience it. And, it's a, and it definitely is, especially when you have a beautiful office, the way you guys have um, and some of the other clients with great locations and the whole nine yards, it's just, it's a different thing that you are able to, again, build a bonding and rapport with a candidate that's not necessarily there, obviously over Zoom. And, and that leads me to the question that I know there's no money back guarantee per se in the, in the recruiting business, but I think everybody's had this where you've got a person, they're just super on it. Uh, they're great in the interview. They have all the right answers, their pedigree, background, everything. And it's like, this person should be a total hit. And then they get into the culture and you realize it's a complete miss. Person should, it's a wrong fit. Nobody caught it. And now it's 60 days later and you, and either mutually or at least one side is realizing this is a mistake. What do you do in that kind of situation? Yeah, it's interesting. It's so, it is, it's difficult, right? Because they clearly, you know, they interviewed well and then they show up and, you know, it's a, it's a completely, it's a completely different thing. Um, I think there's really a, a couple of things that come to mind. First thing is back channel, you know, as much as reasonable. You know, um, because, you know, and with LinkedIn, obviously, it's it's a great way. I mean, that's frankly how I get introductions and those types of things. And I think that, you know, rather than just outwardly asking for references, just find out where did they work most recently or the time before that and start, you know, do your due diligence and fish around because you're going to get a different perspective um, than you would if they were to just share specific references with you. That's number one. That's a good, that's a great one for, you know, for anyone listening, that whole notion of picking up the phone and not just email or, you know, to be able to talk to someone voice to voice and be yep. able to hear from them because you can often communicate or hear 
a lot in someone's tone that, that they might not even want to put in an email. That's right. Yeah, that's, that, absolutely. Absolutely. And then, you know, there, there are other tools, um, assessments uh, to a certain extent, right? Because you can get a, a different perspective on them. It doesn't necessarily mean that the assessment will rule them in or rule them out, but at least help you um, onboard them appropriately and coach them in a way where if there are some weaknesses that were um, you know, exposed or amplified on the assessment that maybe either they fortified some of the concerns that you may have had, um, or maybe, um, you know, allayed any concerns that you had and you don't necessarily need to, to spend as much time on something as, as you may have thought. And the other thing too is, as I just alluded to, which is onboarding, right? I think that um, because we never really know what we're getting, right? Everybody, as I was watching Chris Rock the other day or something, he was, he was on an interview, I think, with I think it was Howard Stern, actually. And he said something like, you know, we don't show up like we like ourselves don't show up. Our, our representatives show up like we send our representative. We, we J. Webb does not show up to the interview. It's J. Webb representative that shows up and it's the best version of, right. <laughs> of, right. of J. Webb. Right. I mean, that's right. exactly that's essentially what it is. Right. So but to so to the extent that that's true, then I think from a a company's perspective, it's on the company to have a structured onboarding process, especially now during, you know, everybody's virtual and the whole nine yards, right? It's imperative for the company to have a structured and consistent onboarding process that will kind of like when you onboard a new uh, um, customer to uh, your software platform, right? Sure. Because you, you, you want to increase the level of success. If you don't onboard a new customer successfully, the level of success is going to diminish um, you're going to increase the likelihood of churn. And I don't think that's any different with candidates. It's the same thing, right? So are you doing that in a way that's going to indoctrinate them into your organization, right? Get them to your point about you can't sell something if you don't believe in it, you know, get them to really um, believe and, and be interested full heartedly in, in what they're selling, um, get them uh, to connect with their teammates, um, you know, their, their, their management, but also cross functionally, like, how do you do all that? And of course, in the pandemic, it's more challenging, um, but there you know, clearly are ways to, to do it. So I would say that that's what it is. It's back channel referencing. Um, I believe it's onboarding. And, uh, and then you know, making sure that you know, if you have access to an assessment test, that can certainly help. Jay, that is a great aha. I, I think that you know, what just went in my mind like that was the notion that, yeah, we have customer success. Mm -hmm. Customer success is, as you just described it, committed to the success of the customer. And, and in terms of the mindset, you know, when you call someone a hiring manager, that's, that's actually very different than the mindset of an onboarding success manager. Right. Right. And I can tell you that at Allego, one of the things that we've done that we've now shared with many of our, our clients who have also adopted it mm. is organizing content through the onboarding process in, in three distinct buckets. So we have one called company essentials. So imagine you join a company and literally over the course of maybe 10 or 12 short videos, you have a message from the CEO welcoming you. You've got messages from other leaders in the company welcome you and telling you a little bit more about what these different groups do. So right off the bat, there's sort of the sense of, okay, if I interact with these people, uh, they're not gonna bite and you know, I, I, I kind of know who they are now. So that's, that's the first piece. Then we have a section called industry essentials. So we have, you know, young ADRs who um, they, they may not even know what the, the acronym SaaS or software as a service is. So we don't take anything for granted. We sort of, you know, a brief history. Where did this come from? What was it called before? What does it mean? And, and, and then, you know, who are some of our um, biggest customers and, and who are some of our competitors? So in short order, they have a basic framework about the industry. And then the last piece, of course, is sales essentials curated by George and Erica and, and Chester in our case, organized very clearly for the sales organization to know this is the framework that we use from Sandler. And this is the, the, this, these are sort of the key ideas that you need to know to be fluent. And we're finding that especially in the pandemic, getting people up to speed and having them be able to go through this process and quite frankly, know that they've gone through the process because there's certain little check-ins along the way where, okay, now it's your time, your turn to uh, demonstrate how you describe the elevator speech, as it were, for a Lego. And sort of seeing all these things really help to indicate pretty early on, is this person on track or not? Right, 
Yeah, absolutely. And that piece, by the way, that I always, um, that I love about what you guys offer is um, but like, um, this is my daughter's in second grade and she uses Lexia Learning and um, Symphony Math. And it's one of those things where um, the teacher isn't with her, obviously, especially now, of course, but in the normal times, they can't be with her um, when she comes home. So the teachers will um, have her go through Lexio Learning and Symphony Math and it levels her up to certain levels where she has a high, the teacher knows that, you know, not anecdotally, Jada, did you understand the reading or the math? It's like, right. you know, it's, 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 um, it's, it's uh, data driven, frankly, to say, yes, she understood this which is why she's moving up to the next level so same thing you know if somebody's onboarding in a sales process and you know they're going out to you know maybe do their first demo or something like that or, or hold their first meeting or whatever and there are you know 10 things that they need to know about their customer or about their project or about whatever it might be and it's like okay let me give you this this is to make sure that you are prepared um, for it and if you're not no worries let's talk about some of the let's talk about some of the things that you need to, to fortify before we have that meeting um, and so yeah that to me is really important because I think, you know, and by the way, even before this whole, you know, let's say in the old days in 2019 and before, <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> when, you know, you had a remote salesperson or in Idaho or something like that, right, they still felt disconnected, right? There were still a lot of disconnected salespeople and disengaged, yeah. risking anyways, dis disengaged salespeople beforehand. And so, you know, all that, well, it, it was important then. It's obviously more important now just at, because it's at scale, because it's not just one random person in Idaho, it's everybody. Um, and it's going to be more, it's going to be important after we get back to whatever that, that normal is. Um, so, yeah, I think onboarding is huge. So, Jay, I want to pick up on this before I ask my last question. And, sure. you know, the interesting thing is while there are many aspects of the academic world that actually, particularly the academic world, from the early part of the Industrial Revolution, you know, the whole framework of the way school was organized for people of our age versus, say, your daughter. Um, what I find most remarkable is that there is some elements of the academic model that still make a lot of sense. And one of those elements is the notion of quizzing and passing a test. And the interesting thing that people don't realize, especially, you know, when people say, oh, I'm not good at tests, okay, there's got to be some method for you to validate, not just for me, but you have to validate for yourself. Mm -hmm. You actually know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And there's a tremendous mm -hmm. confidence that comes when you actually know. And so, you know, you think about an example you just described with your daughter to know that she demonstrated two plus two is four. Okay, so now she's ready for the next thing mm -hmm. versus realizing, no, she didn't get that. We got to revisit it before we move on. Yep. And, and I think that same premise within the sales realm um, because even very seasoned salespeople, what I'm noticing in this time is that they may be super polished enterprise class salespeople, but the whole virtual selling thing and the whole ability to adapt to this piece, that was, that was a big learning curve. Whereas there may have been some of the younger reps that weren't necessarily playing at the same level, but now they, they have a competitive advantage because they're very fluent in this arena. Yeah, it's true. Absolutely. That's right. And that goes to that growth mindset too, as well. That it does. About, it right? does. No, there's no, no question. This is sort of isolating. Are you in a fixed mindset or yeah. are you in a growth mindset? So last question is based on your experience, what is the most important skill that you think people should learn or improve today? Uh, a couple of things, I think video presence, video presentation, I think for obvious for what we just talked about in terms of whether it's interviewing or presenting, you know, just making sure that, you know, you show up to the, to the, to the camera and to the video um, ready to go and, and, and in control. Um, I think social selling uh, is really important. I think for individual contributors to know, you know, you talk about again, um, sort of adapting, right? The adapted, adapt, adapter's advantage, and 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 having that growth mindset. And it's about okay, well, learning, you know, where are my customers, and you know, if they're not on LinkedIn, where are they? Are they on Twitter? They, I found somebody on GitHub the other day, right? Um, so, you know, how do you engage and bring more people in uh, to your pipeline? So, I, I say communication, social skills, um, and showing up for social selling, and then really just showing up for um, the video presentations in a way that um, inspires confidence and competence. Well, Jay, the interesting thing related to the third point you just made there about communication is when we first started Lego, um, so this back in 2013, there were many people who, who said at, at that time, 
Um, I'm not good on camera. I don't like the way I sound on camera. I don't like the way I look on, on camera. Mm. And, I, and I would have to remind them that that's totally normal. And I think in the same way for those emotionally intelligent salespeople that you've described to have their manager be able to show them a, a, sh a short video of themselves and, and be able to quickly point out, look, this is where you're, this is where it's working. This is where it's not. And this is what I'd recommend that you do to try it differently. Now go ahead and do it. And then let me give you some feedback so that you can go do this with a prospect or customer. That feedback loop is ultimately the way to learn and ultimately the way to be great in this new world of virtual selling. Yeah, and just one other point, if I may, which is that not everybody learns the same way, right? In other words, some people are more visual, some people are more auditory, or whatever that word is. Um, other people want to see certain things written. And I think, you know, as coaches and leaders, you know, it's up to us to try to figure out how to um, communicate our message in the best way possible, which is why even with my podcast, it's into yours too, right? It's on audio, but you can also watch it as well. And people want to consume certain things differently. Uh, and then I also transcribe mine as well so that if people want to you know, read it and skim the, the text and those types of things, because you just never know, you know, what, how they're going to learn best and what's going to resonate with them and when and how they want to engage with, with your content. And, you know, whether it's marketing or training, it's, really, it's basically the same thing. If people want to learn more uh, about you, about uh, Jay David, um, what is the best way to, what's the best way to do that? Is it LinkedIn? Uh, yeah, but if I may just give several places because LinkedIn is, is core, right? Just find me J Webb at, at LinkedIn, but then also you can uh, search for my podcast over quota. And then if you want to engage and you're looking for an opportunity, you can go to the J David uh, forward slash looking, or if you're looking to hire great salespeople, go to the J David forward slash hiring. Well, we're, um, we're, we have our fingers crossed that this candidate's going <laughs> to not only uh, work out, but uh, it's going to be a, a win for both of us. So we yes. really appreciate um, not just you being on the podcast with me here, but you are following through in the context of what we discussed today, which is to learn about the culture, to be able to articulate the culture and literally be able to help curate candidates and save us time and energy. So it's, a, it's great to work with you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us this week on Adapters Advantage, available on all major podcast platforms. Make sure you visit our website, alego.com, where you can subscribe to our podcast so you'll never miss an episode. If you liked this show, you might want to check out our virtual training kit to learn how to keep a remote team running at full speed. Go to alego.com slash virtual to download your kit today. Be sure to tune in for our next episode. And don't forget... One new idea can change your life.